Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome back to the High Rise, a laid back, a data back conversation, all things cannabis, where we talk about USMSOs, Canadian LPs, products and market analysis through the lens of data. I am joined, as always, by Emily Paxia. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the High Rise. So great to be back. My favorite conversation of the week. And as always, we've got a ton to cover. Uh, let's dive right into it, Emily. Let's start with Canada. I know sometimes we start with the U.S., but I think, you know, there's some Canadian earnings that have come through and some some headlines. So let's start there. So Tilray announced their earnings. Their stock was up 25% yesterday. I think the, the headlines from Tilray was net revenue increased 27% to $513 million compared to the prior year. And their net revenue increased 25% to $142 million during Q4 compared to the prior year. So, you know, when I look at at this, looking at their 10K, this, their fiscal Q4 ended May 21st. So I actually ran some numbers and headset to see, you know, how it looks versus what we're tracking in the Canadian markets, which is British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario private and um, when we look at their fiscal Q4 versus the fiscal that that same time period in 2020, Canada's up quite a bit, over 90% in in dollar sales. Now, it, we all have to remember that Q4 2020, this fiscal year, March, April, May, uh, was really in the thick of COVID, and so that really had an impact on cannabis sales in general. There were some spikes, you know, some um, stockpiling behavior kind of dropped off, a lot of uncertainty. And, you know, now things are kind of kind of mellowing out. But when we look at just calendar year projections, and we'll get into some of our market projections here uh, for headset with 2020 versus 2021, Canada is growing at about 55 percent. And that's what's tracking so far. And we're in July here, but we expect that to, to maintain throughout the rest of the year. So when you think about 55 percent versus 25 percent, it seems like they're they're a little behind the market growth on on their numbers here. So they're, they're growing their revenue base, but it's just not at the pace that we see coming out of Canada. Any thoughts on that? If I was, you know, like GTI who hits their earnings quarter over quarter, every quarter, you know, I'd be pretty frustrated because it's really interesting to see the two biggest names in Canada they miss on their earnings and their stocks go up. But we know there's other things at play here and, and uh, sure. there's a lot of things going on in the stock market. But um it, I don't know. I, I don't know how you don't keep up. I mean, that was our whole thing when we launched our firm is like, we want our performance to match or outpace the growth of the industry. And mm -hmm. if I was an operator that had as much market share as I do, as they do, or exposure and, and resources, I'd be really thinking about why we can't do that. Now, they did cite issues like you mentioned with COVID. And they also cited because they have leaned in heavily in the European market and the European market has been it's pretty small in early days. And so launching into that is not going to be a, a massive driver of returns yet, but it is a, they are placing a bet on the future facing growth of that market, which coming off of low numbers should be pretty in interesting in, from a growth standpoint, but not necessarily from a numbers standpoint. Does that make sense? And so, you know, I think it, it's interesting. They had to write down, I think some uh, additional inventory but we'll see. I mean, they're one of the only LPs that I, I think has actual EBITDA, which is interesting. And, you know, before even yesterday's 25% stock increase, I was reading the city. City puts out every other week they put out a report. And last week they put out a report showing that the stock was trading at 61.6 times 22 EBITDA, which is like when you're looking at the, you know, U.S. operators, um, you're seeing, I mean, it's in Canada's going at a huge multiple, but you know, if you get into like GTI, it's trading at like 14 times 2022 EBITDA uh, truly is at like nine times, you know, that the median there is nine times, 9.8 times. So it's just a really different market dynamic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, a great point. The last bit of Canada news. So Sundial made an investment into clever leaves through a convertible note here. I think this ties back to what we were saying about Sundial and this investment arm and some of the diversification that it, it enables. Kind of like if you had this fund, I think we talked about a few weeks ago, if you had this fund, what would we, or what would you do with it, right? And I think you did mention something along 
these lines because Clever Leaves has some exposure in Latin America and in Europe, and this is a way for them to invest in that. Do you think, uh, is this in line with what you were kind of predicting? <laughs> well, it, it feels like it. We'll find out. You know, Clever Leaves is one of the bigger global operators in terms of infrastructure. They've got facilities in uh, Colombia. They have access points in New Mexico, and they have facilities in Portugal as well, as well as um, access points into Germany and the UK. They also have really focused on the EU GMP certification so that they can enter into that medical global supply chain. So I think that this is an interesting move on the part of Sundial, kind of pivoting their allocation of resources out of the Canadian market, which we've all seen has been challenging and into a low cost manufacturing and production kind of supply chain out of Latin America, which is a huge opportunity. And I believe just this past week, the president of Colombia has approved the exporting of flour out of Colombia, which was not the case prior to this. So I think that will be beneficial to Clever Leaves and then in turn beneficial to Sundial because it's a convertible. So they've both got the security of it being a credit facility, but also having the upside of the equity components to that. So it's an interesting play. And I think it's, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the impact of the public markets on these Canadian stocks and these quote unquote meme stocks. And we talked also about, you know, if you, if you have that opportunity to utilize your public currency in, a, in an interesting way, then, you know, the, if you don't do it, then you missed an opportunity. And, you know, the CEO and I were chatting and he's like, the window opened and I jumped right through it. So I think it's really smart what they've done here. And I'm curious to see what they are going to do with the Canadian side of their business. But I think this investment arm of the business is, a, is an intelligent way to, to use that access to capital that they have via the public markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's pretty cool to see. And hopefully, you know, we see more of this. I think they're they're well positioned to to do this type of investment and kind of given the size of Canada and and the opportunity in front of them there directly and now that they've got their CPG brand they've got their retail footprint with their uh, investment into Spirit Leaf you know what's next right and I think that this is this is totally totally it well let's let's move on from Canada and talk a little bit about the U S so the big kind of headline over the last couple of weeks has been Schumer and the the bill that's come through, you know, with Cory Booker associated. And uh, he had made some comments early on around, you know, safe banking and not supporting anything apart from, you know, this legislation, right? No, no middle ground. It was kind of like, we're going to go all in here. We're not going to concede on safe banking. And I think that that caused a lot of uh, consternation in the industry. And I think there's quite a bit of pushback because we all know like banking is a challenge, you know, for us at Headset, you know, we're not a plant touching uh, organization, but we struggle with banking challenges. And I can only imagine operators, large and especially small, you know, just being penalized by not having the access to, to banking like a traditional business uh, would have. And then you have the situation where, you know, they've got this great draft legislation that, um, you know, obviously, if it gets through, it's it's very, it's great, it's great. But I think that there's so much risk into kind of getting that across the line, given how hard anything is these days to to get across the line at the at the federal level and kind of the the gridlock that that happens there. So that was kind of what happened. And then uh, it was the last week Cory Booker came out and kind of walked back some of those those comments. Yeah, and said that he would support some sort of banking changes. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, he said if he if we thought if he thought there was reasonable banking change and that there was still the opportunity to move forward with these equity pieces, which I think we all agree we would love to see, then he would support the banking legislation. And um, so, you know, it's good to know he's kind of adjusted his thinking on that and opened the aperture because there's just a lot in that draft bill that we all saw. And I think we'd all love it if we could get it, but I think we all have a realistic point of view of what really gets done at the federal level. And so we're all waiting to see what will happen next. But I, I got the feeling based on what happened. It was a, he saw the Twitter activity around his posts because he definitely got served up some feedback from the uh, cannabis folks. Mm -hmm. And then um, he also, I think may have had some more conversations around 
who does get disproportionately impacted by lack of banking reform. Yes, there is obviously what's going to happen is rich people will always get richer. I mean, mm-hmm. if we're going to speak in crude terms on this, but I also think that you really do have to look at who has the access. And I think it seems as though he's started to wrap his arms around that. So we'll see. Yeah, you're right. It, it seems like the lens he was looking at the banking issue through was, was how is this going to help the people that are already well positioned without really thinking about the other side of the, the smaller operators that can really benefit. And you're, you're right. I mean, the the well-positioned, wealthier, larger scale, I mean, this, it'll be great for them, right? Of course. But it's also equally great. You know, it's it's really important for the smaller operators to be able to to get lines of credit to, you know, just to, to have a bank to not have to just take cash. There's so many, so many benefits. So let's, let's hope that there's a, a path forward. You know, you see the headlines all the time, you know, on the infrastructure deal that's, that's, you know, they're trying to push through. And, you know, that seems like something that, you know, everyone can agree on, you know, everyone drives on our roads and crosses our bridges and like, yeah, that, you know, we need to invest in this country and that's, that's hard to get through. And then when you, you have something that is still, you know, relatively controversial with cannabis, you know, even though more and more red states are legalizing, it just does seem like there's some half steps that maybe we could take to get there along the way with the ultimate goal of getting there. And and let's hope that's the case and everyone's reasonable. And it sounds like with, with Booker kind of walking back some of that, that that is an opportunity. So that's a, a good good outcome. We'll we'll see. I'm sure more to come. So uh, another in other news, uh, you know, here at Headset, uh, we've been doing some market projection work. We we release it on a quarterly basis, and it's kind of a way for us to project out, you know, how how large we think the market's going to be at a national level, where the growth's coming from, you know, and, and what do category uh, sales look like. So we we recently released that report. You can find it at Headset.io under our industry reports section. It's freely available. But, you know, the, the big highlights here are that this year, uh, as I mentioned, we expect Canada to grow 54% to $4 billion, and we expect the U.S. to grow 27% to uh, just under $24 billion. And, and you may hear that, like, Canada growth, you know, it's large growth, but but we have to remember, you know, growth percentages are relative. And when you have a market that's, you know, under $4 billion growing to $4 billion, you know, that can be, you know, a high percentage where the U.S., a mature, more mature market, a larger market, percentage growth is, is naturally going to be small, but the dollar size is, is going to be bigger. And, you know, close to 30% growth is still uh, I would say, you know, very, very healthy growth for any any industry out there. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. And then in 2022, you know, we're projecting over a $30 billion market in the U.S. So again, healthy growth coming through. And a lot of that growth is going to be driven by the new markets coming online. You know, timing is still, you know, TBD on some of these markets like New York and if they're really going to have an impact in 2022. But certainly some are. And some some markets that have legalized and that have frameworks kind of getting their stride like Arizona, even though it has had legal adult use cannabis for some time, you know, it's always the beginning. It's a little slower, although Arizona, it sounds like it's it's doing pretty well. Another kind of notable takeaway is that we project, you know, this year in the U.S. flower as, as market share, as percentage of sales is actually dipping a little bit, but it climbs back up into 2022. And a lot of that has to do with new markets. Flower seems to be a large driver of sales. And as the markets mature, more extracted products come to market, you start to see those impact uh, flower sales. So as more people are buying things like edibles and beverages, which might not be available day one uh, in those markets. So encourage everyone to take a look at the report. But, you know, $30 billion market 2022, that's the that's the key metric there. And, and 2022 is not that far away. And of course, this could grow. You know, I don't think in 2022 we'll see you know, new markets coming online that we haven't, you know, figured out, but, you know, with federal legalization or other markets legalizing, I mean, 2023 and beyond, uh, certainly we're going to see even increased growth from there, which brings me to uh, Cowan. Uh, Cowan updated their market size projections in the U.S. over the next 10 years to $100 billion, you know, might actually be a little conservative when we think about federal change in 10 years. Better have safe banking <laughs> at the very least. <laughs> in ten years, we will yeah. have you know federal legalization. In in ten years, you're going to have a lot of states, uh, new states, and you're going to have states like New York in a very mature position, very sizable metrics coming out of states like that. So, 
I think 100 billion might be conservative when we talk about, was this to 2030, their 10 year? That's right. Yeah, so in 2030, which is still, you know, eight years out, eight and a half years out. But that's a good number. It's a good number. But I don't know. If we, uh, have you ever heard of longbets.com, Emily? You basically yep. make a bet. Yeah. And we'll say, okay, will it be over under $100 billion? And then in 10 years, in 2030, you know, you see who won the bet. And maybe we'll have to do that because. I think it'll be bigger, although I think you think that too, so maybe you wouldn't take that bet. <laughs> I think it'll be bigger, and I think they're going to have to come find me on uh, an island somewhere because I, <laughs> I don't know if in 2030 I'm still going to be doing this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> i have to catch you on your yacht somewhere and, and settle the bet. <laughs> yeah, I'll be out saving the whales, exactly. <laughs> Well, yeah, that, so we'll see, but I, I do think a bigger, bigger number, but still 100 billion by 2030 is pretty, pretty good. And then Arizona, I, you know, just mentioned that uh, they started talking about their first year sales going to top $1 billion. You know what? That's a big story. That's a really big story because most new markets year one is just a mess. I mean, it's just a giant mess. Like licensing is hard. Like, you know, when I think about Ontario, Canada, Ontario, Canada, year one, you know, it was like 15 stores to serve 45% of the Canadian population was just crazy, right? And it took them so long to open up licenses and they're still figuring it out. Now there's, you know, too many licenses arguably, but it, it, it's just, when you look at a, the, the largest province in Canada, year one, how, me- how bad they messed that up. And you look at Arizona, I mean, that's big number for year one, when you look at like a market like Colorado, what were we saying? Colorado is uh, on on pace to do, gosh, over two. Like one point nine or yeah, two, two probably billion. two two billion. You know, if, if yeah. things continue. Uh, so, and Colorado is super mature market. They've had legal cannabis for a long time. So is Arizona. To be fair, right? They had a, a pretty robust medical market that you know, mm-hmm. in many ways was an adult use market. You know, I know a lot of consumers, you know, were able to get, get access in that, in that manner. Uh, so it wasn't starting from, from scratch. I'm picking on Ontario, you know, that was starting from zero, but still to come in at a billion dollars year one with, with like close populations, Arizona's got about six and a half million people and Colorado's five and a half million people. Right. So it's not like the population is super disproportionately larger in Arizona, where it's like, oh, of course it'd be a billion dollars because you got 10 times the population there. It's the same population. So uh, this will be a market to watch for sure. I know there's a lot of MSOs that are you know, active in that market, but I think it's going to be pretty good. I mean, if we're talking a billion in year one, I mean, what's year two going to look like? It's going to be pretty solid. Yeah, I mean, compared to like what we're seeing here in New York, where Cuomo won't even name who's going to run this program, which, by the way, it's a little bit frustrating, just quick sidebar. I feel like he used this issue to like get out of the whole thing where he like was responsible for that whole nursing home full of people basically dying. And then also the fact that he was in a sexual harassment scandal and then, oh, let's legalize weed, a very popular bipartisan issue, <laughs> legalized it. And then now there's no action being taken. And it's like, I admire the way Arizona, I feel like you and I have joked about how like one day we woke up and we're like, oh, they're selling legal weed today. <laughs> like <laughs> what happened overnight? They just opened the doors. And I feel like that was a really, you know, they just got it open. And sometimes you just have to do it. And like you said, they had a robust, you know, medical market because actually it should have passed back when all of the other states, like eight states passed their adult use, but there was a really strong pharmaceutical company lobbying against it in the state of Arizona. It was one of the only states that didn't pass that year. And so I think it was really a lot of pent up demand around having a legal program, which is what I see here on the East Coast where I'm spending some time. But if they don't, they've got to focus on getting these doors open in 2023 or else we're going to have a problem in New York. And um, they should look at what Arizona did because it seems to be working. If you just look at the growth charts, it's like, people are participating in this legal market and it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, New York's got to get out of its own way here. You know, it's, I was there uh, a month ago and people consuming cannabis everywhere on the streets, like more so than you see in, in other urban areas, you know, legal, legal markets, you know, everyone's looking the other way, but all those cannabis products are not coming from the medical programs that are there, you know, the, the limited 
size medical. So, you know, the more that goes on, you know, you're just going to have more of a, a robust black market that you're going to have to tamp down and you're just playing catch up at that point. Obviously, New York's had a, a robust black market for a long time. But, you know, the longer you leave a black market within a legal market that exists, you know, where anybody feels comfortable to consume, I think it's just going to pay dividends for the black market. So the longer it takes to get a legal framework, just the the harder it's going to be to transition people back into, you know, a, a taxed and, uh, you know, regulated market. So, yeah, here's here's hoping maybe, yeah, Cuomo can call the governor of Arizona and ask, you know, if he cares, maybe it was just a look over here. <laughs> don't look over here. Um, but yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of uh, passionate people in the industry that are excited about New York and hopefully we can all kind of keep driving that and, and push that forward. Cause that's going to be a great, a great market long term. And it better open. You said 2023. I mean it, Oh my God, if it's not 2023, yeah. what the hell are we doing here? Yeah. That's like at a send what we're projecting. Cause you know, we have a store in New York and Buffalo mm. and Syracuse, Manhattan, New York, and, or Buffalo and Syracuse. So that's what we're counting on 2023. It, it could, it cannot be 2024. That's just insane. In other kind of market sales news, you know, June, just kind of looking at June sales and we'll have, you know, end of month, July, we can cover this, you know, next week if there's, there's interest, but you know, there's a lot going on in the world with this transition out of this COVID lockdown, you know, it's summertime, weather's good, people are vaccinated, people are going out. There's obviously the specter of the Delta variant, which, you know, is top of the headlines every day. And, you know, we may slide back into something, you know, hard to imagine. But, you know, where we're at kind of on this getting out of COVID, uh, looking at sales, you know, everyone wants to know kind of like what what's happening in June. And um, the, the short answer is it's pretty flat. It's, it's pretty flat when we look at June compared to um, May. So month over month growth or lack of growth in, in, in a lot of markets. And it's not significant, but we're just not seeing much. I'd say on the, on the best uh, side would be Colorado, which grew 5%. So June versus May 2021 grew by 5%. But when you compare Colorado year over year, June versus June 2020, uh, also 5%. So pretty slow growth rates for someone like Colorado. And that's, that's on the, on the good side. You've got markets like Michigan with no growth, Washington, no growth. And then you got Pennsylvania down 6%, uh, Oregon down 5%. Those are the more extreme cases. But when you look at year over year, Pennsylvania grew by 45%. Massachusetts uh, had a bit of growth, 3% month over month. But when you look at year over year, Massachusetts, June versus June, uh, 106% growth. And so I think the story here is like, wait and see. I think the story here is, you know, maybe we're in this kind of strange in-between zone with June. We'll see how it looks in July. You know, we're, we're just a few days from the close of July and we can kind of project out, but it's, it's always good to wait. So I didn't pull those numbers quite yet, but it's an interesting summer, right? And we're in an interesting situation, just like April was an interesting month in 2020 as, as we went into lockdown and it's kind of unprecedented territory could be a situation of, of people just getting out more may spending money on other things any any thoughts emily on that yeah i mean just being here in new york i can't even express to you how the nightlife here i mean new york night like nightlife has always been a thing but people are out and about and at bars and restaurants and i mean here they, you know, you can actually consume cannabis in the open. You're not supposed to, like, you're not supposed to smoke a cigarette at, at like a restaurant or something. But I mean, anyone consuming cannabis here, it's not being tracked. There's a legal market really. So, but I do think like, you know, share of wallet, probably people are shifting their spend to be a little bit out and about and spending in bars and restaurants. And we don't have a whole ton of public consumption places or consumption lounges where people can come together in a social setting like you can in a bar to reconnect with people you haven't seen in a while in a lot of markets that doesn't exist. So we don't get to capture that same social setting, social gathering that's, be, that's happening all over the place right now. And I also wonder if almost you know, this Delta variant, like you said, it's so funny. I used that phrase just yesterday, the specter of this variant. And it's like, 
I almost wonder if everyone's like, we got to get out and do the thing. And unless in case we get shut down again, like what if we get sent back into our living rooms? And so I wouldn't be surprised if people aren't, I, I mean, I kind of have that feeling right now too. Like I'm going to go and be out as much as I can until, you know, I can't in case that happens again. Cause we all had that experience where the world shut down around us. So I don't know, there's a lot of psychology to what is happening right now and, I think a little bit of, you know, PTSD from, from what happened before. And so we were all kind of under this contract of we get vaccinated and we do all the things we get to, we get to have nice things, but I guess we don't get to have nice things yet. So, um, oh, right. yeah, but so I'm guessing it's just a bit of a shifting of a pattern of where people are spending their time and money. And, and if we could gather in social places, consuming cannabis and paying for it in a legal setting, I think we'd see a little bit of a different trend, but not yet. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. And that, you know, could also be partly why uh, some of the markets, the public markets for the like U.S. MSOs are continuing to draw down a little bit. So let's hope that, uh, you know, things get back to normal. At least we, we kind of know what normal looks like in the case of, you know, people trying to get out before another potential lockdown. I'll remember to bring some numbers for July next week and we can talk about how, how that month ended compared to June and maybe year over year uh, for the U.S. markets as well as Canada. Uh, okay. Also, earnings are be coming soon for a lot of organizations, so stay tuned for that as we cover that. And that, that will actually tie nicely to what we see with these market growth as well and see if they're outpacing the market okay. or, or not like we, we talked about with Tilray. Well. I think it's a great place to, to wrap it up, Emily. Thank you so much uh, again today for the conversation and more news coming next week, I am sure. We'll talk to you then. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.